One thing that I've been known for is my Speedo. Oh, um, yeah. Well, let's get into it. Absolutely. Is it actually <laughs> comfortable being in a Speedo? Yeah. So, thighs rubbed together, yes, but squirrel's nut butter will fix that problem. Just the names of these objects, just yep. noodle bag, nut butter, you know. Yeah, <laughs> just, just lube it all up down there and you're good to go. Welcome, welcome to a walk in the park with Malik the Martian, and I have my esteemed guest, Corey Waltering. Corey Waltering, Corey, professional athlete, avid runner, awesome guy, life of the party. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> The party oh, yeah. might be different now, but I'm pretty sure you bring that same energy. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, man. So I'm glad to have you here with me. I ain't seen you in some years. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, oh, man, what was that, like 2019 maybe? Yeah, at Color the Crag. Oh, yeah. And, you know, just speaking on Color the Crag, you know, affinity spaces like that are so important. I think about how much that just one weekend spent with people of color, it changed the whole trajectory of my career. Yeah, that's awesome. How does those like affinity spaces, how do you view them and their importance? Yeah, you know, I think it really is an important thing just to like give like-minded people that space to be open and share about their triumphs, their struggles, yep. um, things that they've been dealing with that, you know, uh, sometimes other people just can't quite relate to. Yeah. And it's like, it's there's nothing wrong with the people that can't always relate to those stories, but sometimes you just have to have that space to speak openly and honestly about it. Yeah, I mean, it's like a community safe space, you know what I mean? Absolutely. I think isolation is what weakens us in the industry. Absolutely. If you're over there and you feel a certain type of way, I'm over here and I feel a certain type of way, we'll never know how much strength we have if we come together, if they keep us apart. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. How do you bring your own style and fashion to the gear that you get? You know, it's kind of been a challenge recently, um, just <laughs> to be completely honest. What because, colorways or what stock plan? Yeah, so like I'm actually super thrilled with like this last year's seasons where it's like we had some oranges, some greens, like some actual patterns on things. Yeah. Because it seemed like for so long it was just like black, white, gray. Yeah. And I'm like, what is this? So, like if you want to be the team that stands out and if you want to be noticed, then why are we wearing like earth tones and black and white? Yeah. But one thing that I've been known for is my Speedo. Oh, um, yeah. Well, let's get into it. Absolutely. It's really funny. So this Speedo came about, um, I'm actually with noodle bags now. Okay. Um, so yeah, noodle bags. Noodle uh, bags. That's, ba what, that's what it's called. <laughs> absolutely. We don't, we, you can figure out what the noodle is on your own, good people. <laughs> But um, back in the day, it was like 2017, I flew to Florida for a 50K. Okay. And How far is that in miles? I know we just say, I've never ran past a 10K, so. Perfect. 50K, so 31 miles. And it was in April, but I thought, hey, it's Florida. I get to go to the beach. This is going to be perfect. You know, pack that Speedo, and then I just have to run 31 miles. But you came with a, a swimsuit to a race. <laughs> yep. So I packed my Speedo. I didn't pack my running shorts. And so uh, on race day, I was like, oh, no. I was like, what do I do? And they're like, put the Speedo on and race. So put it on, raced, won the race, uh -huh. and then... That is where Speedo Man was born. That's where Speedo Man was born. I always wonder why you wore a Speedo, because I ran college track, believe it or not, good people. Before <laughs> I smoked like a chimney, I used to run like a car, or I don't know, <laughs> run like a horse, or run like some other majestic animal. But uh, I have bigger thighs, and you know, I was on cross country, but yep. I used to run and get like diaper rash, because it would be like oh, yeah. these wet shorts. Yep. Does your thighs rub together? Do you ever get a wedgie? Like, is it actually <laughs> comfortable being in a Speedo? <laughs> So, thighs rubbed together, yes, but squirrel's nut butter will fix that problem. Just the names of these objects, just yep. noodle bag, nut butter, you know. Yep, <laughs> just, just lube it all up down there and you're good to go. Okay. Um, so yeah, there you go. That is how I stay chafe free. Chafe free. <laughs> <laughs> anti diaper rash click over here. <laughs> Even in the speed of. How did you get into trail running being from a relatively flat place. But trail running was not something that I ever even really set out to do. Yeah. Um, especially in college, like I said, didn't like cross country, <laughs> but um, didn't I like cross country runs a hundred miler. <laughs> it doesn't make sense anymore, but you know, it is what it is. 
Coming from a track and field background, cross country background, and then I was also a swimmer growing up. I was too. I was and the so, only person on the swim team. Yeah, like the, <laughs> we actually had two black people on the high school swim team, which they're like, oh my God, it's yeah. amazing. I went to the school in the hood. I was the swim team. <laughs> and it used to be like at a meet, how you know, like I swim. Come back, uh, they like, all right, next race, the 50 free. I'll just get back on the stand. And like, I remember what I do was like, oh my God, you got you doing all the races? I'm like, this or we don't place in city, bro. <laughs> like, I need to get in fourth and all this. Amazing. So yeah, like with a run background, a swim background, mm. in college, I bought a bike and found triathlon and had just some success with triathlon very early on. Okay. So after college, I actually moved from Illinois to Boulder. Oh, snap. Me. Did you meet Steve from Boulder with the red camera? <laughs> you know it. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably going to try to tell your story soon. He has a red and, you know, he knows black people very well because of his camera. <laughs> So it's like moved to Boulder because what Midwestern kid doesn't move to Boulder yeah. thinking they're going to become a professional athlete, um, which was just kind of funny because I ended up hanging out with like trail runners and mountain bikers once I got to Boulder, which was completely foreign to me. Yeah. And my coach is like, you, you should focus on the road stuff. But my friends are all like, oh no, come to the dark side, come to the trails. Come to Chautauqua. Yeah. <laughs> and so I went on my first trail run, my first mountain bike ride, loved it. Uh -huh. And just told my coach, I'm like, I am quitting triathlon and I'm going to focus on trail running. Yeah. And my friends are all like, oh, they're like, you might not go pro and trail running right away, but they're like, just give it like two years mm -hmm. and it will happen. But going pro was a goal of yours. Uh, for triathlon, not for trailer. I didn't. I still did. I didn't know what trailer running was when I moved to Boulder. Okay. Like I didn't know that it was a sport. So okay. when I saw people out actually running on the trails rather than hiking, I'm like, what kind of witchcraft and sorcery is this? It is witchcraft and sorcery. I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I see like an old dude like, <laughs> and just hurt my soul. You know what I mean? Like, totally. I can't wait till I acclimate to the elevation. <laughs> totally. Going west changed the whole trajectory of your career it seems like absolutely um it when, went yeah when uh, did you know trail running could be a thing for you like at what point were you was like okay i'm crushing or i got a chance at this i paced a friend and crewed for a friend at the leadville 100. okay same year that i moved to boulder he's like hey you know i need a pacer i need crew and i was just like i don't know where leadville is i don't know what this race is did what you get a melisana <laughs> i was just like <laughs> i did actually I was like, what What does a crew do? What does a pacer do? Uh -huh. And he's like, wow, you really have no idea about the sport, do you? I'm like, nope. So ended up going crewing, pacing, fell in love with it, uh -huh. left Boulder and moved up to Leadville for a year. Okay. And that's when I was like, oh, I think I'm going to try to focus on the Olympic trials for the marathon. Oh. People are like, why did you move to Leadville if you're going to focus on the marathon? You're like, focus on the goals here. So I ran my first 50K that fall, finished third. Then my next ultra was Silver Rush 50 up in Leadville. Okay. And finished fourth, but missed the podium by 52 seconds. Ooh, and miss how did it that eat at you? Yeah, it still <laughs> eats at me. So missing the podium by 52 seconds is absolutely the moment when I was like, I will be good at this sport. Uh, <laughs> that's your cannon event. Absolutely. 52 seconds. You sons of <laughs> Yep, after being out there for a little over seven hours, it's like the race came down to 52 seconds. I remember watching that dude, like, going up the final hill to then come down the ski hill to the finish as I'm, like, rounding the corner waiting to go up that hill. And it's just like, why is this happening? Yeah. Those 52 seconds absolutely changed everything for me. Wow. 52 seconds. Changed the whole trajectory. <laughs> Well, we're about to change the trajectory here in a little bit. How about you say we're cranking up a notch? About three to four miles an hour? Let's do it. All right, I'm gonna I'm go three, five. I'm gonna work my way up to four to see if I can still walk, you feel me? Okay. All right, it's a little, yeah, a little ginger pace, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that 52 seconds, is that your most memorable race? Or is there another race or another location? What was like the one that left the imprint outside of the 52 seconds? There's a race called Muggy on 100 okay. in Arizona. It's put on by, by Era Viper Racing. Okay. And this race totally sticks out to me because it was my second DNF at, or did not finish at yeah. the 100 mile distance. Don't feel bad, I'd be DNF in every race. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you see me drive across the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> but it became a big thing because 
that was like my last big event that I had kind of focused on back in 2021 yeah. uh, before I decided to get sober. Okay. And so for me, like that race, like not finishing that race was kind of the start of like, oh man, like what what is going on? Like, why am I not finishing things? Like, why why am I not performing how I should be? Yeah. So that race was like, hmm, all right, let's take a step back and start looking at things. Do you feel that your lifestyle and not being sober was impacting your running and your physical abilities by like waking up feeling like, does that impact your training, like being hungover or like, what was it for you coming to that realization to get sober? There are a lot of things that all <laughs> went into that. Um, but I would definitely say that, you know, the lifestyle of wanting to still be like the young kid, the cool kid, the party boy, but yeah. still able to finish 100 mile races or yeah. finish things like the Ice Age Trail FKT that was 1,200 miles. You stayed or, up for two days. Uh, during Pinhoti, absolutely. I stayed up for almost four. Uh, no crack cocaine involved? <laughs> nope. No methamphetamine? Nope. Just wow. canned wine. <laughs> I knew it had to be something, a special elixir in there somewhere. <laughs> totally. But so, like, I would say that, honestly, it was interesting because I was still running 80 to 100 miles a week. Mm -hmm. um, I was still going to shorter races, doing decent at those. But at some point, it was just kind of like, what are you doing, dude? You know, like, this is not who you are. This is not the athlete that you are. Yeah. It's just like, oh, man, like, we have to fix this. Mm hmm Damn, that's a real athlete. I seen something you said on Instagram, like, if being sober was easy, you wouldn't do it. Because, I mean, it seems like you're up for a challenge in most of your things. Totally. And for me, sobriety is like, yeah, I probably should be sober. I probably can, like, exit. This is the bad thing about being gifted. <laughs> it's like, if I'm putting up 100 points a night and I'm drunk, <laughs> Why the hell do I need to get sober? Yeah. And sobriety kind of seems boring. You know, like, I like being the party boy and it's still handle business, but, like, I'm 35 now. <laughs> <laughs> and the shit ain't as cool as it used to. Totally. But, yeah, if it was easy, you wouldn't do it. So, like, how did you just tackle that sobriety beast head on? A lot of work. So, like, early sobriety sucked. Like, it absolutely sucked. I'm and... glad you said that because people act like, oh, yeah, it's fine, you know. Oh, yeah. Like, like everyone will be like, oh, look at me. I'm like one week sober, then one month sober. Like, it's great. And it's like, no, it's actually really not that great, <laughs> uh, to be completely honest. Because when you go from like drinking or whatever all the time mm -hmm. to just stopping, it's like you are cutting out all that sugar that you've been taking in. Yeah. And so like you just want to eat everything from the bakery. You want to drink all the sugary drinks. Yeah. You can't have enough coffee. It's just like. I drink a lot of soda when I quit drinking. Yep. I go through bouts. Like the longest I went was 55 days. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, But I, you know, I've, I've experimented when I was younger. I had a lab coat on. <laughs> <laughs> but I have never experienced something with a monkey on my back like alcohol. Yeah. So, like, how did you fight those cravings and power through and keep your eyes on the bigger prize? Yeah. And when did you start seeing results from it? My last drink was Halloween of 2021. Okay. Uh, That's a good way to stop. Scared? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Halloween is my favorite holiday. And so, just like, I'm going to have three drinks on Halloween and then I'm done. And, like, that's literally how I did it. So... I surrounded myself with a lot of people that have years of sobriety, mm. talked to lots of people about it, was just very open with them about what is going on and like trying to get to the root of like why I was drinking so much. Mm. Um, more than just like alcohol is readily available everywhere you go. It's crazy. <laughs> Could you imagine a heroin aisle in a grocery store? <laughs> like when you're sober, that's what it feels like whenever I drive down the street and I see a liquor store, liquor store. Go to Kroger, it's a wine aisle. It's like, oh, yep. I'm trying to be good, but damn. It's wild, like it really is. And so like that first month was like, oh, okay. Like I kind of feel okay, but not super, super thrilled. Mm -hmm. Then the next few months after it like really sucked. Um, and <laughs> this it was... is so much encouragement, people. <laughs> <laughs> but the next few months are just kind of like, yeah, you know, they say that once you get sober, things get better, but it's like, I'm not running any faster. I'm not running any better. Mm -hmm. Like. Sure, I was sleeping good for a few days, but now I'm not really sleeping that great, so we have to figure this out. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, do I want to go out with friends to watch football, or do I want to stay home and watch football, or like... The temptation, you know? Yep, it's like always there. And so because of that, like, it just took a lot of work of like, 
really being mindful of the situations I was putting myself in. Yeah. And just re- trying to remove those situations of like, there's going to be alcohol or I know that I'm going to be hanging out with people that I used to drink heavily with, like stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, and it's hard to turn down those drinks because it's like, I don't know, I'm like, hey, bro, I'm not drinking right now. It's like, for real? You ain't yeah. just going to have just one? Yeah. And it's like, I can't. You know, you wear you down with those nose. It's hard to, you know, like keep saying over time and time. Totally. And it's like, yeah, when people are like, oh, can't you just have one? I'm like, when have I ever just had just one? And it's like, I've never had just one of anything. Yeah. Whether it's a drink, running a mile, a cupcake. Like, I don't care. I've never just had one. I have an addictive personality, people. <laughs> yeah. It's like, why do people think that I run ultras? Because the marathon wasn't enough. You know, you have to run the ultra marathon. So it's a different type of addictiveness <laughs> for you then. It almost is, you know. Um, same thing like coffee right now. It's like, oh, I got sober and I'm going to cut out alcohol. But now it's like, great, I drink 10 cups of coffee a day. Is that any better? Probably well, kinda, not. You know, they say like people who become sober kind of swap one vice for another. Absolutely. It might be a healthier vice. Now you just run a whole bunch and nobody's going to be like, you better stop. <laughs> the doctor ain't gonna be like, did you just run 10 miles this morning? What's wrong with you? <laughs> i never forget when I was drinking like heavy in 2018, my grandma, I was taking care of my grandma, she was passing. My ex was cheating on me with the neighbor, so I was real sad. And I was drinking like a pint a day. And I remember I went to the doctor. He was like, how much you drink? I was like, just a pint. And like him and the nurse was like, what the, f- yeah. a pint? I was like, yeah, just a pint. And I was like, yeah. do you know how much that is? I'm like, well, pint. <laughs> yeah. So many milliliters, you know, I'll be fine. Oh, yeah. I definitely had a couple conversations like that as well, where uh, I had to go to a cardiologist at one point back mm. in like 2020, early 2021. Mm. And he's like, how much do you drink a day? And I was like, oh, maybe two bottles of wine. And then he's like, oh, like a day. And I was like, yeah. And then it's like, every once in a while, there might be a shower beer or, you know, if I go out with friends or whatever. And he's like, well, he's like, I guess it's just kind of like normal 30 year olds, whatever. And it's like, probably not, but okay. <laughs> you know, I'm like, that was one of those moments where it's like, oh, I don't drink like normal people. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like, it's, it's when you have that, like, that shame, you know what I mean? Like, I was at an event and it's like a wine tasting and I had like <laughs> 30 cups and like, I was holding myself together and I came back to get another one. There's like one dude serving all night and he was like, Hey, he leaned into me. He was like, hey, man, this is a wine tasting. This ain't for that. And he just said it to me. No one else heard it. But I was so fucking embarrassed. You know what I mean? Like, damn, like he knows. But, <laughs> you the, know? but then you're also like, but I can hold my own. It's fine. Yeah. And but then, the fact that like. And then it's like. Mm. If he can pick up on this one, don't know me. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's just like, oh, man, maybe I should start uh, reevaluating my relationship with alcohol. Totally. My parents were a uh, drug addict, mm-hmm. you know. And I don't judge them because, like, you know, it's like the war on drugs. We lived through the crack epidemic. Sure. But, um, you know, we see with uh, opioid epidemic when it happened that they're not bad people. They're people who are sick and they need help, you know? Absolutely. And I spent a plethora of my youth, like my dad, when he'd do, like, father time, he'd take me to, like, an AA meeting. <laughs> and I would hear, like, the most horrible stories, you know what yeah. I'm saying? I'll never forget it was one meeting where they're doing the chips. Yep. It's like, if you're one week sober, come get a chip. One month, one year, you know? Yep. And I was like eight years old. When they got to eight years, I like walked up there and everybody was like, (laughs) you don't get a chip, young man. I'm like, I haven't done crack since I was born, bro. So I've been sober for eight years. I love it. Can I get a chip? And it's like, here, get out of our face. (laughs) (laughs) It's amazing. (laughs) But it's just, you know, I don't know. For me... I still remember some of those stories, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And, like, I keep myself in check. But I've been working myself up, like, okay, at the end of this year, I think I'm going to be done with alcohol. Because it is one of those things where um, I don't drink often. Especially, I got a girlfriend now. She keeps me, like, no drinks during the week. Yep. You know, if we're out, no drinking in the house. Yep. Uh, If we're somewhere in this drinks, then you can have one. But it's like, like you said, I don't ever just have one. Yep. And because I know that it's embarrassing, but it's also like a very sobering thing to be honest with yourself. Absolutely. Because I think so many people who uh, are afflicted with addictions, it's hard to have that honest moment with yourself. Or just how many times has someone been like, I don't want to do this anymore. And like you don't. And then you do. And like nobody talks about when you let yourself down. Don't nobody know. 
you can brush it off, but also you feel it. Yep. Was it ever moments like that for you? Oh, there have definitely been moments where I've just been like, hmm, like, is this really worth it? Because, like, when I first got sober... You feel I, like you're losing something almost. Yeah, well, I was like, oh, man, like, I know that, you know, you're not supposed to be, like, remember all the great times that I've had with alcohol. Yeah. But there have been some great connections that I've made with alcohol. I mean, and there have been some wild stories that have come out of it that it's like, hmm, were those my finest moments? Probably not, but I'm also not going to hide from them. Yeah, Like, can I tell the story to the camera? Absolutely. So the last time I saw Corey, we are at Color the Crag, and... You climb all day, run all day. Then at night, you party harder, you know? And Corey was sitting in this chair all night. He didn't move all night. And he had a bottle of wine. <laughs> he just drank it. And towards the end of the night, everybody going to their tents. And uh, me and my homeboy Burleson was like, Corey, let us walk you to the tent. And Corey's like, I don't need no damn help to get to no tent. And I'm like, damn, let me help you. I put him, get your hands <laughs> off me. He stands up, takes one step. Flat on his face. <laughs> and me and Burleson get him up and drag him to his tent. But uh Absolutely. Well how about busting it into a little jog? You feel Let's like you handle that? I'm gonna go about like four five. I'm keeping up with him, people. I just need y'all to understand that this is the ultra runner man. I probably ain't ran this far since like college, bro. <laughs> now I'm lying. I try to do like a 5k multiple days out the week, like two, three days, but they're not fast. But you said something about, you know, being your true self um how hard was it for you to be your true self publicly like you came out what 2018 uh 2016 2016 yeah but like what were some of your fears like did you think it was gonna hurt your career um did you feel like it would limit your social group and you know what was that process like for you because you've never like been shy when i met you totally <laughs> But just funny, I tell people I'm shy all the time, and they're like, you're absolutely not. Uh, um, so, yeah. Um, came out in 2016, so I was tw uh, 26 years old. Okay. And it was wild because I was, like, trying to figure out my way in the trail running scene, the outdoor space, mm -hmm. and just didn't know of any, like, openly gay professional trail runners, people mm -hmm. in the outdoors. And then I had being black on top of that. And I'm like, huh, it's probably, it's like, I don't know, like our sponsor is going to love this, hate it, mm -hmm. who knows? And so like, I think that's why I just didn't for so long. Yeah. And I mean, it's a personal thing. I hate that coming out is a thing, you know? <laughs> like, totally. As a cis hetero man, straight cis het, it's like, I never came out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. It's like, it's just who I like. Totally. And I don't know why we don't apply that same type of mindset to people existing. Or to people feeling like you owe us this information. Totally. <laughs> Which is so interesting because, you know, multiple people have said that where they're like, well, when you came out, they're like, we didn't really think anything of it because they're just like, we just always thought of you as Corey. So yeah. like, they're like, it doesn't matter. Which is awesome. But like when I came out to my friends, like it was super funny. I was like, I gathered everyone in my, well, not all my friends back home. I was back home, actually. So I gathered all my friends and went out to the bar. Uh -huh. I'm like, hey, like, I have something important to tell you guys. And they're like, okay. So we're there having a couple drinks. I tell them. And they're just like, yeah, we know. Yeah. I was like, what? And they're like, <laughs> yeah. And they're like, we, how did we you know? know. <laughs> I was like, but how did you know? I haven't told you before. And they're like, oh, we knew. Yeah. And so I was like, I so, was the complete opposite with my best friend. Known him since I was 10. He came out to me in 2016. And he was like trying to give a whole big speech. And halfway through, I was like, you're gay? He was like, yeah. I was like, is that why the f you can fucking decorate? Like, <laughs> like, he got his first apartment at 19. And I went over his house and he had accent lamps. And I was, he had, he had towels that you don't use in the bathroom, display towels. I was like, I, you went to Pier 1. I should have you know when you went to pier one <laughs> but it's like you're my boy regardless you know yep. and i never thought about your sexual orientation because it don't matter you know totally you date who you date you know he used to do this like this is my roommate yep chuck you know? yep. i'm just like what's up chuck like you <laughs> you must ain't got a lot in here you know <laughs> like, <laughs> y'all always taking selfies and <laughs> but it's just like I was, you know, I did. It doesn't matter in a grand. I mean, it's important to individuals. Sure. Because you want to be accepted for who you are. Yep. Um, everybody wants to be accepted. So 
but yeah, that's just coming out. But like your sponsor, it didn't stop that, you know? Totally. Like I had a great race season, signed with Innovate that next year and for them for two years and mm -hmm. then been with the North Face since 2019. Beautiful. I got uh, involved with TNF like officially 2020 and there was a lot going on that year. Yeah. Um, as a runner, how do you feel about like what happens to Ahmaud Aubrey and um, you know, just being a black man who trails run by yourself, because I can't keep up with you. But uh, <laughs> how does it feel to be able to like continue on? And I don't want to say his legacy, and that's how the racism is, you know? Yep. Because uh -oh. he was just existing. He wasn't a martyr, you know? Yeah. He wasn't a, a civil rights leader, and he damn sure didn't want to die for the cause. Yep. Um, but how does his, how does his existence and racist demise affect you as a runner personally? Yeah, uh, that's a really tough question because like, I'm just one of those people where it's like, if there's something that I wanna do, I'm gonna go do it. Yeah. And so, you know, living in the South right now, like I'm in Chattanooga. Yeah. I love it there. Um, Even the Confederate flags. You know, like. <laughs> it's, Don't tread on me, boy. I have stories about that as well. Um, <laughs> so it's like, I do a lot of stuff in the North Georgia mountains. Yeah. Like I go to places where I don't have a cell signal. Mm -hmm. I'm out there alone, sometimes after dark, you know? Yeah. It's one of those things where I, I'm not going to let somebody else's ignorance or fear stop me from doing what I'm going to do. Yeah. And so because of that, like I go out there, I let people know where I'm going. Hopefully I can share my location with them, whatever. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's like, <laughs> I'm going to do what I want to do. And I've also found that in some of these smaller towns in Tennessee, Georgia, it's like I've actually had very positive experiences yeah. with people that, you know, just looking at them right off the bat, you wouldn't think that it might be such a great experience. Yeah. Or, you know, I've had to stop at the gas station that has a Confederate flag. And yeah. I'm like, oh, do you guys have coffee? And they're like, oh. We don't have any hot coffee right now, but we'll make you a pot. Like, okay. so I'd have to watch them. <laughs> we got a special pot of coffee for this, by the way. <laughs> so, like, but it's like, honestly, like, I've had great experiences where, you know, I think that sometimes you just have to get out and put, like, feet uh, on trail or, you know, in that yeah. moment and just experience it. And I don't think we are necessarily as divided <laughs> as a country as mainstream media thinks we are. Yeah, because once you start interacting with people, what I found is like, there are things that divide us and barriers, et cetera, but when you give people a chance to talk to you, you'll find out that you have way more in common than you have differences. Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, like, I hate that I have to be like, I have to make them see me as a human. Yeah. But, like. I am always one of those people where it's like, I am a person, I belong here, I am going to take up this space, and you will see me for being a person. Exactly. Now, being like seen and being a highly visible person, like one of the biggest things I struggle with is uh, keeping it real, holding people accountable, but yep. also within that, how that affects uh, what people say about me going forward. like. You know, I don't want to be the angry black guy. Yep. But sometimes you motherfuckers make me mad. Yep. So, like, how do you deal with regulating <laughs> your emotions and feelings? Even when you're in the right, you can be telling the truth. And just because you're black and, you know, holding people accountable, maybe a tad bit harsh. Yep. Um, you can be hard to deal with. Yep. You know, when people said I was, like, hard to deal with, the company I was talking to, I was like, well... They didn't say that when I was doing what they wanted. Yep. So how do you deal with those type of perceptions and, I don't know, preceding them before they happen? I will say that, like, when I was still drinking, Yeah. Um, if I had to have one of those difficult conversations and, you know, just at the end of the day, people are like, hey, you should calm down a little bit or that or whatever, I'd probably just be like, oh, I'm just going to go drink and calm down. And there you go. And whatever. I'll just yeah. leave it alone. Like, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Now... <laughs> As a sober person, <laughs> my mind is always going on things. And I'm always just thinking like, 
okay, this person said this, or this person maybe brought up this, like, how can I bring this back to a level that distills it down so it makes sense to them what I'm trying to say without saying it louder mm -hmm. or having to repeat myself? Yeah. Because just because you say it louder or repeat it doesn't mean you are correct. That's good. So, I'm like, I will just come at you with facts. Yeah. And if you can't understand that, then that is not my problem. And it's one of those things where you have to start removing those things from your life. That is true. I try to use uh, humor as a way to make things more palatable. Uh, yep. ra racists get mad when you call them racist. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, being racist. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to be called a racist? This is racist. So I thought, wear that shit proud, you know? <laughs> but they don't like it. Um, now, over the years, you've done a lot of changes, you know, personally and physically. I noticed you got like quite a few piercings. Oh yeah. So like, what do your piercings mean to you? Or is it all like migraine stuff? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. The first piercing I did was my nose and it was basically, hey, I'm gonna go get my nose pierced. And then when I was sitting there in the chair, I decided I wanted two piercings. So I got the double nose piercing, which I've added a third. Yeah. But a lot of stuff in the ear, um, like, one of them was like i did a campaign for visit reno tahoe okay. and like reno's known for tattoos and piercings so i got a piercing during this campaign which okay. was uh pretty awesome and in, then the, I, in the commercial you got a piercing yep out of sight yep and so then after that it was like wow like this is kind of fun so a lot of stuff now is like different sobriety markers or different countries i've traveled to for racing and then i'll get a piercing after the race oh wow that's tight yeah I should do that with with tattoos. Absolutely. Yeah. My goal is to make enough money where I can get a face tat and not be socially a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I cat. love it. I'm a social outcast. I just need a little bit more money, so, you know. Love it. My girlfriend's against it, but we'll see. Yeah, she'll come around to it. <laughs> but, you know, over the years, you've had some successes, ups and downs. I just want to know, you know, how has your goals changed? Uh, over the years, and what do you have in your sights moving forward? I yeah. mean, you, your last Instagram post, you're talking about working your job, the connections and, you know, regulation having the schedule gave you. Yep. So like, as you said, big changes are coming. So what's some of those things without telling too much, what you got brewing? You know, I, I've enjoyed the job at the shop that I was working at in Chattanooga yeah. uh, for the structure, okay. but you know, changes are coming. And by the time this thing comes out, yeah. those changes will have happened. Okay. So I can talk about it. I'm actually moving up to Maine. What the and, heck? And yeah. You gonna be on a lobster boat or what is that? No. So Work I, at a lighthouse? <laughs> ah, so I took over as a, <laughs> as a guest experience coordinator for a lodge up in Maine. Okay. And Is it mountainous there? It is. And so they have water, mountains, all of it. Okay. Super pumped for it because they kind of want to be known as like an outdoor adventure hub. Yeah. And I love the outdoors and adventure. So super pumped for that. Um, Cause like my big thing has been trying to find the outdoor community, trying to build it, trying to create it in these different spaces. Uh -huh. But then like through this lodge, it will actually open up opportunities to like bring in a diverse clientele to get them into the outdoors. Okay. I am super pumped for some of the plans I have up there. Okay. Uh, some of the people I've been working with, just trying to get camps set up, clinics set up, That's tight. different things like that. So super pumped for that. And then when it comes to racing, uh, I don't really know what I'm going to race, you know? Like yeah. I raced the Eco Challenge back in 2019. Loved that, loved the sailing, the biking, climbing. Yeah. And so super excited to get back into those types of things. Okay. Um, running will still be the focus, but just kind of expanding the horizons okay that's beautiful well you've luckily made it to our lightning round Woo! so you know we went for a little jogging jive now let's uh kick it up to the you know wherever you feel comfortable put a little little fire under your butt people i'm about to die i want y'all to know i was at my limit 20 minutes ago oh he see i don't like how <laughs> his sounds faster i'm at six all right i got full stride i feel good all right, you ready for this rapid round? Let's do it. All right, this is a game of this or that. Camping in a tent or camping in a hammock? Uh, hammock. Hammock, why? Uh, I just like to be off the ground. <laughs> okay, 
I call it bear food. Uh, <laughs> hiking in the mountains or exploring the beach? Exploring the beach. Okay. I like to go running in the mountains, but explore the beach. Okay. I mean, your speedo probably blends in a lot better out there. Absolutely. Uh, sunrise or sunset in the wilderness? Sunset. Why? Um, sunrise requires getting up early. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> and the alpine glow at night is better, if you ask me. Um, backpacking or car camping? Uh, backpacking. Why? It's more fun to have to rely on whatever you have on you uh -huh. rather than having extra things in the car. Okay. Well, I guess harping off that, would you rather cook over an open fire or a portable stove? Uh, no. Oh. I guess open fire if I'm going to choose backpacking, but portable stove is definitely the way to go. Okay. Jet boil has never done me wrong. There you go. Boom. Uh, would you rather winter sports or water sports? Winter. Ooh. Yeah, winter normally has better gear. Yeah. So. I always say like in the summer, I can strip butt naked. Yep. And still sweat to death. Yep. I can put on enough jackets and be warm. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you're in North Face, so I know you got to do this. Huh. Huh. Rope climbing or bouldering? Ah, uh, ropes. Okay. Make you feel safer. Yeah, too many people break things when they're just bouldering. Yes, they do. I've had a couple of snapped ankles, good people. Oh. Uh, mm -mm. You're going to like this. Cross-country skiing or snowshoeing? Uh, I've never been cross-country skiing, so snowshoeing. Okay. Uh, canoeing or rafting? I really don't know the difference. Uh, <laughs> rafting with the rapids. That sounds way more fun. Okay. Sunrise yoga or stargazing? Uh, I'm not doing yoga, so stargazing. <laughs> Yoga's boring. It sure is. I can just breathe and sit on the couch, people. Everyone's like, yoga's so relaxing. No, the fuck it's not. Nah, I'm gonna stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I say. Favorite season to camp in? Ah, uh, fall. Colors, leaves. Yep, yep. Yeah. Fall colors, the orange, red, yellow, amazing. Okay, last one. I'm gonna kick it up a little bit. Woo! Backpacking in the wilderness or glamping in a luxurious cabin? Ooh, I'll take the cabin on this one. Uh, I do enough of that wilderness stuff where it's like, let's take the cabin. Yeah, I mean, glamping looks good on Instagram, right? Absolutely. Well, good people, this has been a walk in the park. I'm your host, Lisa Martian. Big shout out to Corey. Woo. He is, he's just warmed up. I'm in my wits here. And you know, it's been a good day. Sure has. I appreciate you. Absolutely. And I think I'm gonna head on now. <laughs> <laughs> that kinda hurt. <laughs> that knocked the wind out. <laughs> Damn, yeah. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> if it would've been. If it would've been straight grass. The wood knocked the wind out. <laughs> Damn, dog. <laughs> this is what I do for y'all entertainment. Walk in the park. <laughs> oh. Can I say it? Cut. <laughs> Amazing. I knocked the. Yeah, I know. <laughs>